We're going to take up with uh, number nine on your uh, outline, number nine. If you do much reading, you'll be aware of uh, the increasing influence of uh, secular feminism on the churches. Um, let's see, ten years ago, I believe it was, Jack Cottrell wrote a series of four articles in Christian Standard on the gender distinctions. Excellent, excellent series. But now if you've been reading Christian Standard the last uh, several weeks, uh, you find, uh, out of fairness, uh, they've been giving both sides of the issue, so forth, uh, scholars that are uh, for that and those that are not. Um, there's an increasing trend, women elders, women deacons, women preachers, and so forth, and the people are becoming more vocal uh, on, on those issues. I'm not going to get into that whole issue tonight except um, to refer you to, um, I don't know whether any of you uh, have uh, Dr. Cotton's book on the faith once for all delivered. Any of you have that? The faith once for all? That is probably the best volume out in the field today on almost all your major doctrines, Bible doctrines. Um, I personally, of course I'm biased, <laughs> I believe that uh, Dr. Cottrell is one of the most brilliant scholars we have in the movement today. And um, in that book, he has a series of uh, different articles on this issue of feminism. In fact, he just taught a, a six-week course out of Bright Church. He's on teaching staff out there too with me. And he just taught a series on this subject of um, the gender issue in the church today. Excellent, excellent series. Uh, you could probably get the outline of his um, lectures if you emailed him or wrote him. But I would recommend um, um, that, his book and so forth, uh, where he uh, deals with the scriptures, the pertinent scriptures, and deals with the fact... And the reason we're coming primarily and, and people are coming increasingly vocal is because of the influence of our culture. They're making it a cultural issue. That's the way they're interpreting scripture in the light of culture and so forth. And, um, but that to me is a um, potentially divisive issue that is rearing its, its head. Um, to me it's always been a puzzle how a, a woman can be the the husband of one wife, but um, that, anyway, that's the way they deal with it. And this is not, and Jack Cottrell makes it clear in his articles and in his book and so forth, this is not a put down of women at all. At all. And he exalts them to their place. And where would our churches today be without the women? <laughs> Most of them would fold up, I'm afraid, because uh, there are so many important roles that women play in the church. And um, in leadership roles, but not in roles of authority, not in roles that are allocated to where God has play, placed particular roles and so forth. So that, um, that's a subject that's worthy of considering, but at least to be alert to and to keep yourself educated about and informed about. Another uh, is this um, trend that I hate, again, people say somebody just mentioned a while ago, well, uh, you're quibbling about words, you know, uh, and so forth. Words aren't important, and so on. And uh, they're more important issues. These are side issues. I think words are important. Words convey uh, thought. If words weren't important, uh, what's the point of words, you know? Words are given so you can understand. Um, words are so important. Um, but is the trend that we're seeing increasingly, we didn't hear it hardly at all, but boy, just in the last couple years, it has become, it's snowballing, in fact, where we are referred to as the Stone Camel Movement. The Stone Camel Movement. 
uh, Stone and Campbell would turn over in their graves, I'm convinced, if they heard this movement identified as their movement. Uh, I can remember back just at the end of it, where once in a while you would hear the word Campbellite. That's the way the denomination world referred to anybody who was a member of the Restoration Movement. Derisively, they referred to us as Campbellites, saying, well, you're followers of Campbell, you know. And down in Kentucky, people referred to us as Stoneites because they, they were part of the movement of which uh, 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 Barton W. Stone uh, was a part. But um, when my mother and father attended the Centennial Convention in 1909 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Centennial Convention of the Movement, they said already by that time, the term Camelite had almost fallen into disrepute because our people had so consistently repudiated it and rejected it. And now we see that title coming back again. And the rationale for it is this. <laughs> Some of my good friends are using this term, and I write them about it, and they say, well, the rationale for it is uh, to identify it from other restoration movements. Because there are other restoration movements that are out there that claim to be restoration movements. And so we have used this title to identify this particular restoration movement. I said, hey, let that sell itself. Why not just be referred to as New Testament Christianity or a restoration movement? And never to restore the church after the New Testament ideal. So, but that is becoming a trend, and I see it coming up in periodicals that it never used to appear in, in church bulletins where it never used to appear, uh, and in conversations where it never used to be used. And to me, um, it's an alarming trend that will sectarianize our movement and make us just another denomination in the eyes of the religious world. Um, Today, another thing has reared its ugly head. Again, I thought it had settled down, but lo and behold, uh, it's increasing again. The elevation of matters of opinion to matters of faith and make them tests of fellowship. See, that's what happened beginning in 1850 on up to 1906, where the musical instrument became a test of fellowship. It was made a matter of faith. It was made a matter of doctrine. Whereas it was an expedience. It was a method. It did not have divine sanction. And I know of no Christian church or church of Christ that has ever taught the use of the instrument as a must, as a command, as a doctrine. You can worship with it or without it. <clears throat> In churches, sometimes they'll sing three verses with an instrument, one a cappella. Sometimes they'll sing a whole song a cappella. Sometimes, on occasion, they'll... An instrumental church will have a whole song service a cappella. Today, however, things have changed as far as our a cappella brethren are concerned. Some of them are now having a service where they use the instrument, some of them where they're a cappella. <clears throat> Many of them that are still using just simply the non instrument position are no longer making a test of fellowship. They will fellowship with us. They'll come into our services. They'll sing with us in our worship service, even though we're using an instrument. But it's their preference not to. With some, it's a moderate matter of conscience. And that's perfectly all right, as long as they don't make it a test of fellowship or a matter of faith. But what's happening today in our movement? Styles of worship and styles of music is again becoming a very, very divisive issue among our people. And it is splitting churches. We have not learned the lessons of the past. <clears throat> I am, if you want to call it, a traditionalist. <clears throat> My favorite music in the main, not always, are hymns and gospel songs. But I learned a long, long time ago that, you know, not everybody's taste and preference is that way, and especially our younger generation who are the future of the church. And so, sometimes I'm in a service that make me uncomfortable, so forth, not my preference. And then my spirits revive when they inject the good old hymn that I can sing tenor, alto, and bass to, you know, so 
But, uh, you know, some of the people uh, that object most strenuously to some of what they call the contemporary music are actually scripture set to music. You ever do that? And what is important, the style of music or the message? And I know some traditional hymns and gospel songs that are about as theologically wrong as they can be. So, you see, brethren, if we don't if we don't keep our wits about us and say, this is not my preference, this is not my taste, but I'm never going to be guilty of causing it to be an occasion of division and a test of fellowship and try to make it a matter of faith. Because it's not. And uh, we, have to, we have to realize that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. There are different tastes, different preferences. And you know, unity is not based upon uniformity of opinion. If it were, there would never be unity. Nowhere in the scriptures do you teach that there has to be uniformity of opinion. Unity in faith, unity in doctrine, oh yes, the scriptures make that very clear. But not unity of opinion. And so, one of our slogans, which we've forgotten, in matters of faith, unity. In matters of opinion, what? Liberty. And here's the key. And by the way, those are three themes that are going to be preached at the CRA's conference, Bible conference uh, this October out at Christ Church at Mason. Dr. Cottrell's going to open up the conference, speak on the subject in matters of, of faith, unity, in matters of opinion, liberty. I'm bringing up the end of it. I don't know why they picked me. Everybody else is a sandwich between Cottrell and me. Mine is the last part of this one, in all things love. And the success of the first two are dependent upon our implementation of the last part of that slogan. And that's where I see, and what hurts me more in churches, how nasty people can get, how bitter they get, how mean they can get over matters of opinion and taste and preference. And brethren, the thing that hurts me more than anything is to see the people who've been Christians all their lives, we supposedly mature, doctrinally sound adults, are the ones that are making the issue out of it. When you hear these babes in Christ that come into the church, you know, they, they aren't steeped in all this. It doesn't make a difference. It can be a hymn, a gospel song, or a contemporary chorus. It doesn't affect them any. Then here we come along and we say, hey, you can't have this, you know, and it's a rest of fellowship. So it, it, it's a tightrope, I know. And we're all humans, aren't we? <laughs> I am. And uh, like Ben Merrill used to say, you say, if something that doesn't happen in worship service that makes me uncomfortable, I know it hasn't been a successful service. <laughs> I don't know that I go quite that far, but uh, nonetheless. Well, um, but brethren, that's an issue. Where are we today? We've got to keep that in mind. It's all right for us to have our opinions and our preferences. But let us not make them tests of fellowship or matters of doctrine. Then, um, number 12, and this to me perhaps is more concerned than anything else. We are beginning, as I'm seeing it, in our movement to almost go full circle into what we experienced a hundred years ago. And that is the subtle and gradual infiltration of liberal theology into our movement again. And it's nothing new. It's the same old arguments in liberal theology that was introduced in our movement a hundred years ago. It's just being resurrected. And um, it's not prevalent. It's way below the radar today. But I'm reading articles by some of our so-called scholars today that just make me shake my head. They're repeating exactly the very thing that we contended against 100 years ago, 80, 90, even as late as the 50s and 60s. The same thing. And um, when I read those things and see that where some of these scholars are being introduced, where their writings are being sent and being read, it gives me 
alarm. And again, I think, like the Apostle Paul, when he wrote the elders of the church at Ephesus, you remember when he called them down from Ephesus to Miletus, that last trip, he said, remember, I cease not to warn you night and day with tears. For three years he said I did that. Three years I cease not to warn you night and day with tears. He said, because from among your own selves men will arise speaking things that are contrary to the doctrine. So we need to be alert. You need to be informed. You need to be biblically literate. You need to know how to recognize a wolf in sheep's clothing. You need to know how to recognize a slippery slope. And it's like R.C. Foster um, made a statement one time, I'll never forget it, in a conversation that he was having with his students. I was in his class. He was telling them about this background. He said, when this began to happen, back after the, before and after, right after the turn of the, of the 20th century, he said, I had to make a decision. Was it to take a stand now or to wait? Because when he said now, it was in its incipient form. It was just in its embryonic stage. Should I take a stand now? Because he realized that if he took a stand then, he would be very unpopular. He'd be maligned by his brethren. He'd be accused of all types of wrong motives and so forth. But then he made this statement. He said, but I realized that if I waited till later, it would be too late. And that was true. He took a stand then. And he wasn't appreciated by many of his own brethren. He wasn't maligned. And so forth. But then, when along came the court trials and restructure that we talked about last week, then all of a sudden, that stand of opposition became popular. <laughs> oh yes, when it's popular, everybody climbed on board. Back when it was not a popular stand, R.C. Foster and others like him stood almost alone. And we owe to them the heritage that we are sharing in today. And the future generations are going to look to us and our generation as to how faithful we've been in the stand we've taken. So with this increasingly post-denominational age, I am convinced restoration principles are more relevant than ever because I see them work every day. I was holding a meeting in Hampton, Iowa some years ago and um, there's a man in town. He was one of the most successful. In fact, he was the prominent businessman in town. He was a 33rd degree Mason, a very upright, good moral man, but not a Christian. I went into his home because his name had been given as a prospect, sat down, he was on the sofa, I was in a chair and there was a big coffee table before us and on that coffee table there was one of those great big old Good Shepherd Bibles that evidently a salesman had come to the community and sold them. And uh, when I uh, went to the scriptures, here was his response and this is very prevalent. Mr. Bream, he said, um, he said, I appreciate your coming, but he said, you know, everybody's got the same Bible but they read it differently. It means different things to different people. It just depends on how one interprets it. People understand it differently. I said to him, are you willing to put that to the acid test? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you have a Bible right there on the coffee table before you. I said, open it up, and I'll help you find scriptures. And I said, I'm not going to tell you what I believe or what the church here in Hampton believes. I'm just going to ask you a series of questions. I'm going to cite you to scripture and then I want you to read that passage Then I'm going to ask you and you answer me from the Bible. I'm going to ask you, what did they ask? What were they told? What did they do? How did they do it? So I said, turn to the second chapter of the book of Acts. He turned to it. I said, now begin reading there with the, with the 36th verse. And he read it, that all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God hath made both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom we've crucified. He said, read the next verse, 37. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I said, what did Peter tell them? Read the 38th verse. 
Peter answered and said to them, Repent, therefore, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I said, read what their reaction was, what they did. Read that 41st verse. He read it. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. I didn't say a word. I said, turn to the 8th chapter of Acts. We read the account of the Ethiopian eunuch. I followed exactly the same procedure. He would read it, so forth. I'd ask him what they, and so forth, what they did, how they did it. Went to the Saul's conversion. Went to, went to uh, the Cornelius' conversion. Went to the Philippian jailer's conversion. Lydia, we went through all the conversions. When we got through, I just simply looked at him and I said, tell me, is it a matter of interpretation? He looked me in the eye and after a pause he said, it appears, Mr. Bream, that it's just a matter of doing what the Bible says. That night he stepped down that aisle, confessed his faith in Christ. We had three snowstorms, blizzards, during that two-week revival. After that baptism of that man that night, we had 17 more baptisms. And that church had a balcony. Nobody had sat in that balcony for 25 years. But from that point on, that balcony was full every night during that revival. And I could recount, well, let me recount one more to show you that it is relevant and it works. Um, I was in Michigan City, Indiana in a revival. There was a Roman Catholic woman and her Methodist husband who were attending at the invitation of their friends, neighbors, who were members of the Michigan City Church. On the fourth night of the revival, as I was greeting people at the door as they were exiting, this couple held back, and I noticed that. When most of the people left, they stepped up to me and they said, Mr. Breen, we like what we've been hearing, and we've been considering becoming a member of the Christian Church. But, she said, I've been Roman Catholic all my life. She said, in fact, as a young girl, I was reared in a Roman Catholic convent. She said, my husband is a Methodist. And she said, it's hard to make that kind of a break in a decision. I said, do the two of you have a few minutes? They said, yes, we do. So we left the foyer. We went into a side room, closed the door. And I said to them, I said, I'm going to be perfectly candid with you. I said, the Roman Catholic Church believes the tradition is on a par equal in authority with scripture. I said, I believe what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 16 following, when he said, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and furnished completely unto every good work. I said, that satisfies me. I accept the Bible, the Word of God, as my only authority. I said to them, do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? They said, oh, why? Well, we've always believed that. I said, are you willing to accept the Bible as your only authority in religion? They paused a moment, and then they both said, yes, we are. I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, virgin born, only begotten Son of the living God? They said, why, well, we've always believed that. Both of them said that. I said, are you willing to do whatever you find Jesus asks you to do in his word? They both said, we are. The work was done. They didn't know it yet, but the work was done at that point. I said, all right. I said, they didn't have a Bible with them, so I took my Bible, but I wasn't going to read to them. I said, I'm going to turn over here to Jesus' last words on earth. This is after his death, burial, and resurrection. He was just about ready to ascend to the Father back into heaven. I said, I want you to read what Jesus told his disciples to do. Read it here in Mark 16, 15 and 16. She read it. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. She stopped, she went back and read it again. He that believeth and is baptized, she said, well, I didn't believe when I was baptized. I said, what did Jesus say? She read again. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I said, now let's see if the apostles obeyed Jesus. If they did what Jesus commanded them. I said, turn over here to the second chapter of the book of Acts. I said, this is ten days later. 
The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles as Jesus told them it would if they waited there. And I said, Peter stands up and he preaches the first gospel sermon. When he gets to the end of it, I said, read what the people asked. And I followed the same procedure I did with this man. She read it. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? I said, what did Peter tell them to do? She read it. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. She backed up. I mean, she was a sharp lady. And read again. Repent and be baptized. She said, well, I didn't repent when I was baptized. I was just a baby. I said, what did the Apostle Peter say? She said, repent and be baptized. I said, is this what you and your husband are ready to do? And then she began to hedge. She said, well, you know, I told you that I, I was reared Roman Catholic all my life, and I was reared in, in the convent as, as, a, as a girl and so forth. It's hard. I said, yes, but remember, you said that you believe the Bible was the word of God. You said you were willing to accept the Bible as your only authority. You said you believed that Jesus was the son of God. You said that you would be willing to do whatever you found Jesus asked you to do. So is this what you are now prepared to do? She and her husband looked at one another and she said, would you give us a few minutes? I said, certainly. I excused myself, went out in the foyer where their neighbors and a few other Christians were still waiting. Ten minutes passed. The door opened. Husband and wife stepped out of the foyer and they, she said, my husband and I are ready to be baptized into Christ. There at 10.30 o'clock that night, they were baptized into the Lord. See, my friend, it's just that simple. Without benefit of clergy, you just take the word. What, is, what does the Bible say about the word? Acts, Hebrews 4. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing of soul, spirit, and bone, joy, and quick to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Jesus said it was the Holy Spirit who would bring conviction with respect to sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And when you let the Holy Spirit, let his word do its work, people that are honest searchers for the truth are going to do it. And what did Jesus say in John 8? If you shall know the truth, the truth will make you what? Free. That's why I say, the restoration principle is more relevant today than it has ever been. And our post-denominational world is ripe for it. If we will familiarize ourselves with these great principles, if we become again biblically literate, and not wanting to win arguments, but in love sharing the good news of God's love for man, people will respond to the gospel. That's the plea. So the only thing that can curtail the effectiveness of the restoration plea in our time is the abandonment of those principles that are eternally relevant. And next to that, if you and I lack the commitment to proclaim this plea with clarity, passion, and in love. Any comments? Any observations? Anything that anybody would like to share tonight? You can tell I'm in love with the plea. And I tell you, it's, it's, it, it works. And that's the thrilling thing about it. It works in the hearts of men and women and young people. Well, we've covered a lot of territory. We've covered 2,000 years in four two-hour sessions. And I hope it's been informative. I hope these notes will be beneficial. Of course, your outlines are skeletal outlines, really, you know. But it's on audio and also video both. DVD, and, and also it's available if you want to refresh your minds and so forth with any of these basic principles, why uh, do so. Well, I've said all I've got to say unless some of you want to say something. You've all been awful quiet. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not against scholarship. I am for scholarship. Absolutely. Conservative biblical scholarship. 
Um, when I went to Cincinnati Bible Seminary, we had three PhDs. When I left, we had 14 PhDs, which shows that I believe in scholarship. We gave sabbaticals to our men. But what we always did, and this is the thing that we made sure of, we talked to them before they went so they knew what they were going to be confronted with. Our faculty was always at hand, ready. They could communicate back and forth, phone, letter, any other way, personally, with situation problems. And when they came back to our campus, we always debriefed them to make sure we knew what they believed, if they still believed what they believed when they left our halls and so forth. I believe in that kind of scholarship. But today, I'm afraid we aren't quite that circumspect. Um, and this isn't to condemn all scholarships. Don't you know, we have a lot of great scholars out there in our colleges. But again, I'm seeing by articles that are being written by some of these men that are cause for alarm and for, for me, so forth. And um, I, I don't believe in witch hunting. I'm not, uh, I don't believe in witch hunts. But I do believe that we're not to be naive or gullible. How many times in the scripture you find, be alert. Be on guard. Watch. Those are words that crop up in the New Testament all the time. And that's what we had. The hope for the future of our movement is Paul's statement to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2. And the things which you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's the hope of the future. That we keep teaching faithful men who will teach faithful men who will teach faithful men. That's the hope for the future. And I take hope. There are some young preachers out there that I just love with all my heart. They're on fire for the Lord. They have a love for people. Uh, they believe the word. They preach it passionately and so forth. And then there are others that have disappointed me. Great church. I've been there, spoken. Uh, Back when Reggie Thomas was there. And, yeah, Bob and, Stacy And Tom Thurman. And, yeah. yeah, and uh, Paul has a uh, campsite here, and we were working on the campsite, and we really enjoyed your uh, your uh, session here. <laughs> I wish we had one of these at our place. And uh, but uh, we're seeing. I've been a past elder and at our church for a number of years, and chairman of the elders, and not serving now, and uh, really kind of disappointed in our Bible colleges and the young men that are coming out. Not. You know, I, I'm not saying all of them, but uh, I'm seeing a liberal bunch of young men that are coming out of our Bible colleges. Uh, and well, the it, farther removed you get from the origin and source, that that happens. I mean, that that's that's history. That's human nature. And uh, it seems to be. <laughs> and you can uh, do it in one generation's time. It's I've seen churches that had strong preaching. Right down the line, great elders. But you get a man in there who's charismatic, you know, and uh, it's, it's so easy. People, I, I, I've heard sermons sometimes that I just curl my hair, and I've heard people have been in the church all like, what, that's the greatest sermon you ever did hear? And I just say, where in the world have these people been? You know? Well, our, for an example, you know, we've got a traditional service. We've got a church of 500, 550, whatever it is, and, and you know, we've got a, a traditional service and a contemporary service. And uh, whether that's good or bad, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say. Uh, you know, you've got the young people that go to the, the second contemporary service, and, and you have a praise band that plays at the second service, and you've got the, the good old gospel the gospel music uh, that's in the hymnals that are played at the first service. And Many churches have gone that route. This uh, and I go to the second service and and the praise the praise band uh, I've I've watched this regress to where uh, we've got kids up there and and uh, that are playing in shorts and sandals and and t-shirts that uh, that are there's things on the front of that t-shirt that that in my opinion should not be worn to church. And, and, and that's the responsibility of your worship leader and your preacher, and I think the elders. But our preachers are saying that, 
you know, we, we don't want to say anything to young people because it'll turn them off. I mean, yet we was watching a couple CDs on uh, George Fall, and George Fall says, hey, you have to attack that that kind of liberal stuff. Uh, you have to you have to you have to take it with love, and you have to go right to it and say, hey, enough is enough. And uh, you know, that's that's my feeling. That's why I'm not serving as an elder today. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't use a brick bat, but uh, yeah, you can reason with people and so forth. But. Uh, well, I could say I I haven't <laughs> okay, I, I have spoken I have spoken to our leadership. Yeah, but it's biblical. You go to the person. So. Uh, Good point, Leo. Uh, Notwithstanding, Brother Harvey, do you think that the split services like that are they good or detrimental? Or should we? You know, I, I mean, well, again, it's a matter of opinion. You know, I I think. Um, I, I hate to see generational gaps uh, in, in a church. Um, um, at Bright, there's a great relationship between our kids and our senior adults. I mean, there's a, there's a great camaraderie. I mean, there's no distinction so forth. There's just a cross-cultural thing, so forth. And uh, I think the division, it's my opinion, I, I think there, there's something good about young people being with the seniors and the seniors being with the young people. But, um, and sometimes I've found, seen in some churches where in the contemporary service, some of the seniors enjoy going to mix with the, with the kids, you know. I call them kids. Um, with the young people and so forth. And um, again, at Bright, we're experiencing some young people that are coming in and they're hearing some of these hymns and gospel songs They've never heard before, and they like them. In fact, I read somewhere, I don't know whether it's in the Standard or some publication somewhere, where young people are starting to drift back toward the gospel songs and traditional hymns. So you see, those things are fluid. And by the way, you know, when you talk about change, would you go back, say, well, let's go back and do it the Bible. Well, would you go back and sing in Psalms? That's what they sang in the New Testament church. So would you, would you, would you go back and sing in those chants and so forth? Uh, or go back to you know, Martin Luther, for instance. One of the greatest hymns today that our people really enjoy singing. A mighty fortress is our God. You know where he got that tune? Out of a bar. Because he said... The common man knows that tune. It's a barroom tune. Everybody knows that tune. So I put Christian words to that tune. Today it's one of the most beautiful, popular, traditional hymns. So you see, change, you go back and trace change. I wrote an article on it. Change from Pentecost up to the present time. Change in styles of music. Changes in architecture. Changes in everything. I can remember when we put our first overhead projector in and put our first screen up in our auditorium. People were horrified. Some people were. Maybe some of you were. <laughs> An overhead projector. And then the next thing you know, we went to uh, video, then PowerPoint. You know. I mean, you look at all the changes we've gone to. So, I mean, change has been with us in so many areas. And every change is resisted, and every change is hard to take. Some changes are good. We should never change just for change's sake. I mean, that, that's a poor philosophy. You don't change for change's sake, so forth. But sometimes you change to accommodate the culture, as long as you don't change your message. The old saying, you know, methods change. The message never changes. So those are the things that you always have to take into consideration. That's why I say I think one of the touchiest issues right now is with our feelings involved, our emotions involved, our tastes and preferences involved, which are normal, to not allow them to become tests of fellowship and make them matters of doctrine. 
which they are not. Some of you are smiling, some of you are. Our Christian service can't serve the same purpose today that they served in 1907. Right. To me, that is, again, an argument that we, we battled with. When I went to camp, well, in fact, for many, many years, the Christian service camp was the main feeder of our Bible colleges. Most of the students that came to Bible college came out of the Christian service camp where they made a, a life commitment for specialized Christian service, right. But then, and I, can, I still know the camp manager <laughs> that kind of spearheaded the movement, former missionary, he said, oh, that is exploiting the kids that's taking advantage of their emotional immaturity and they make commitments they never intend to keep and so forth. I said, because there's been an abuse, my argument back to him was, just because that may be abused, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't approach the Galilean service, your commitment to Christian service that way. I said, and as a result, but eventually it became the mode now, I don't know whether any camps I have commitment services the last night to challenge young people Christian service. I know it's true, fewer and fewer young people coming to Bible college are their product. A lot of them that are coming to Bible college are products of the CIY movement. Christ Youth Movement still makes a strong appeal to um, life commitment service and so forth, specialized service. nineteen eighty nine which pretty much covers what you covered here tonight is that correct or this week I, was, I and, suppose many places I don't know where it would have been in 1989 you made a series of, of VCR tapes on pretty much the same subject. oh okay yeah on, um, on the church in Bible and in history that's right okay and uh, I would recommend that this has some of that information but that even goes into more detail I came particularly tonight to see where we're at today <laughs> because that ended what you brought up to date was in 1989 and uh, so I wanted to see where where we're at today and uh, well, so tonight gives you where we are at today and uh, pretty much uh, and I don't throw up my hands I just say these are things you have to watch <coughs> careful about become biblically literate know what you believe why you believe it um, Know these beautiful principles of restoration and so forth. Uh, that's the hope for the future. Because the farther away you get, why people forget history and then repeat the same mistakes. Derek, you have something you want to say? Anybody else? By the way, that series um, that just been referred to, the church in the Bible and the history begins with Pentecost. And it comes clear up to 1989, not up to the present. And uh, it's on DVD now. The Christian Restoration Association sells them. They're on DVD um, so forth. And um, it really needs to be updated. I just haven't had the time to, to update it. But um, it is available. Okay, Derek. Thank you all for tolerating me for these four weeks.